Hey, Art Freaks. Apologies if you can hear my business partner in the background. She has some opinions right now. So today I want to do something a little bit different. Uh, it might be a product of formal academic training in college and all the art history classes they make you take. Or it could just be the teacher side of me, but I really feel like there's a lack for art history. So I thought we'd do a little mini lesson today. And because it's been so nice this weekend in central New York, and I've actually been able to get a little bit of mini adventuring in, we're going to do the Hudson River School. A little quick background, the Hudson River School was a painting style movement situation started by Thomas Cole in about 1825. Cole was English, but he came to America and specifically New York, started landscape painting in the Catskills and the Adirondacks. Uh, it's a en plein air style of landscape painting, very heavily influenced by Romanticism. A small group of artists from the Hudson River School ended up moving westward in the 1860s and formed the Rocky Mountain School, which is basically the Hudson River School, but out west. The most notable Rocky Mountain School artist was Thomas Moran, and he is credited with inspiring the creation of Yosemite National Park, and so by extension, the entire national park system in the United States. So... You're welcome, rest of the country who enjoys national parks. Because 1800s, there were several women involved in the Hudson River School who weren't recognized at the time. And that's specifically wanna, what I want to highlight today. Because the ladies had some of the richest, most mature, and most luminous paintings of the entire Hudson River School. Uh, their light is to die for. Mary Blood Mellon was born Mary Blood in 1819 was a painter originally from Massachusetts and later New Hampshire. I kind of focused on New York when I was explaining the, the quick background of the Hudson River School, but the Hudson River School painters were kind of all over New England. And if you've ever hiked or climbed any mountains in New York and New England, you will understand why. She became a student of Fitzhenry Lane in the mid to late 1840s. Lane was a painter and a printmaker who was uh, aware of the Hudson River School, but he wasn't really formally associated with them. He's actually usually credited uh, as a luminist, just sort of an offshoot of the Hudson River School with an even greater emphasis on the light quality and the luminosity of landscape painting. Sometime in the 1850s, Mellons and Lane became collaborators, which you can see in Coast of Maine. They both signed that one. By the 1860s, their paintings were exceptionally similar, and Lane was very frequently traveling to wherever Mellon was living at the time to paint with her. If you compare Mellon's and Lane's work, it's very easy to see the influence both in her use of light and her choice of subject matter. Lane was marine painter, a boat painter, like marina. He was a marina painter, that's the word I'm looking for. Her sunsets and moonlight landscapes are some of the most ethereal and beautiful that I've ever seen. The moonscapes in particular, they conjure up a lot of thoughts of spiritualism, which was becoming a thing and we could do, it, spiritualism could do an entire video unto itself. Interesting enough, uh, Lane was later discovered to be a spiritualist, although Mellon was a good little pastor's wife, so she probably was not. Julie Hart Beers Kempson, born Julie Hart in 1835, and known as Julie Hart Beers in all of her painting work, was one of the few women painters of the time who was acknowledged and recognized by the art world in her own right. Her father was a painter, her brothers were painters, and her first husband was a painter. So even though women didn't have access to formal art training at the time, she managed to learn from the men in her life. Most notably, her brothers are usually credited with being her, probably being her main teachers. The contemporary recognition lacked by other women artists at the time led William Gertz to say of her in the exhibition catalog for Women Artists of America, 1707 to 1964. So he wrote this in 1965. Mrs. Julie Hart Beers Kempson became the only woman artist of the century to specialize in landscape. It is perhaps not surprising to find so few women landscapists, since the rigors of painting outdoors and the unseemliness of women engaging in this activity during the Victorian era acted as a deterrent. <laughs> really, Gertz? Really? <laughs> okay. 
We'll ask Susie Barstow about that later. Anyway, disparaging of other great women landscape artists aside, Beers is really amazing. Her work looks exactly like the kinds of reference pictures I take while hiking, like the things that I flood Facebook with and all of my friends are like, why did you take 13 pictures of the same tree? Except she has better light and more beautiful light and I really just want to go take a hike in her paintings and hang out for a while and never come home. Harriet Canny Peel, born Harriet Christina Canny in 1799, came to art a lot later in life. She began her studies with Rembrandt Peel sometime in the 1830s. She later married him in 1840 and had her first exhibition that year, so she was also a little bit recognized in her time, again, because she was associated with a male artist. She is frequently disregarded as a copyist or overshadowed by her more famous artist husband, free to crowd represent. I'm not positive I agree with placing her solely in the Hudson River School due to the diversity of subject matter in her work. I could really only find these two landscapes when I was going through her really well-known body of work, but she definitely rec deserves recognition in her own right and on her own merits. So last, but certainly not least, Susie M. Barstow, born in 1836, was my kind of 19th century gal. She had no connection to the art world whatsoever before studying art at Rutgers Female Institute. The clothes a proper woman of the day was supposed to wear annoyed the hell out of her, so she said, fuck it. She climbed all the high peaks of both the Adirondacks and the Catskills. Um, if you know anything about hiking, particularly peak bagging in New York, the... We have 46 peaks that are above 4,000 feet. Um, they're the high peaks of New York, and it's it's a thing it, to climb them all. Something I have not even done yet. I need to need to get on that. Uh, she hiked the Alps. She hiked the Black Forest. She was a member of the Appalachian Mountain Club when it was first started. She was an adventuring artsy lady. She traded her petticoats for trousers. She shortened her skirts to well above her ankle. Uh, the pictures I've seen, they were like calf length, which is pretty scandalous. You didn't see shorts get that high for the general population until like the 1920s. She put rings on her waistcoat. So a waistcoat in the Victorian time is kind of like what we might call a vest these days. It's a slightly different garment, but uh, it was the layer between your blouse and your outer jacket. She put rings on them so that she could hike her skirts up even shorter when she needed to. And she trained those dainty little Lewis heel Victorian lady shoes for some sturdy thigh, uh, knee-high boots. She brought her drawing supplies and watercolors while she was peak bagging and managed to get in still sometimes 25 miles a day and a sketch, which blows my flipping mind how anybody can hike 25 miles a day, I think. My max is 10. She would make studies of the wilderness out in the wilderness and take it back to her studio for completed oil paintings. She was really well known to let nothing stop her. She's even famous for painting in a freaking blizzard. A blizzard. Snow and wind and fucking cold and everything blowing all over. If you've never experienced an upstate New York winter, I don't know how I can impress upon you that that is like one of the most impressive things I've ever heard of happening. Her paintings are pretty quintessential Hudson River School. They have the transcendence, the really stark natural beauty, the sense of stillness and solitude. Um, when I'm looking at her paintings, I can't even imagine that there was a person there to capture the image because it's just so open and, and wild and beautiful. They could be any hiker's camera roll or Instagram feed these days if you're part of the backpacking community. You will look at Susie Barstow's paintings and you could see those on your favorite hiker's Instagram. If these don't make you want to strap on your pack and get hiking, I don't know what to say to you. I can't help you with your life and I'm really kind of not sure what you're doing here watching this video. Uh, there were actually uh, many many more women that were part of the Hudson River School and they paved the way not just for women artists and subject matter beyond women's work but they also paved the way for women hikers, outdoors women, and women who became some of the first national park rangers. I'm leaving links to all my sources down below 
If you are at all interested in this, please check them out because there's so many more women than I could fit in one short little 10 minute video and they are very deserving of your recognition and your remembrance for their work and how much they were bucking the trends of the time. I'll be back next week with a more art practice or adventuring type of thing. Let me know how you like this little art history lesson because I think I'd like to sprinkle these in from time to time. Learning is fun. Looking at art is fun. So yeah, if you like this, YouTube should be suggesting something else you might like that I've made recently. And I will see you next time. Don't forget to go art something today. Bye.